Good morning, everyone. I see people are joining. Got up to 66 participants so far as we're kicking off the, the first Education Data Science Summit. And so as a, attendees continue to join us, I'd like to give a few reminders about the event. Um, my name is John Watson. I work at the San Diego County Office of Education as a data scientist. So it's great to see this event take off. We're gonna start today with a keynote about the statewide cradle to career data system. And then we'll have our three sets of technical sessions from 9 a.m. Uh, to noon across the various interest area tracks. Um, and then at noon, um, all are invited to join us for a virtual lunch and a speakers panel where we will ask the question, what are the high priority metrics that we should be looking at as we emerge from the pandemic? Uh, great question. I think some of the speakers are gonna stay along and uh, participate in that event. So we're looking forward to that one. As far as logistics for today, um, the day's schedule and information you need to find sessions and Zoom links, et cetera, is on the sketch page. The, the link is on the bottom of the screen. And um, aside from the sketch page, um, it's important to note that the Zoom links are active 10 minutes before each session. So if you visit a session in sketch uh, you know, half hour or 20 minutes beforehand, you won't see that Zoom link activated, but once it is, uh, go ahead and click on it and join the session. Once our keynote uh, completes, the technical sessions, as I mentioned, will start. These are gonna run on the hour at 9, 10, and 11 a.m. with 15 minutes between the sessions. So that'll give you quote unquote walking time to get between your sessions and get ready for the next session that you're gonna attend. Um, we wanted to thank our sponsor, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation for their assistance. Um, we also have had support from the EDFI Alliance. We appreciate that as well. Um, also, we're really thankful for the committee um, of some, some of the members of our county offices of education, um, including David from Monterey County, Steve and Nick from Riverside, Dave from Orange County, and uh, John Massey from San Bernardino County. Thank you very much for the help over the last six months in putting this event together. Also, thanks to all of those at the San Diego County Office of Education. Um, many of our innovation staff are assisting with room moderation today, and I, I appreciate in advance uh, Dr. Gothold's uh, support of our uh, event. Dr. Gothold is our superintendent at the San Diego County Office of Ed. Again, it's, it's nice to have you here. For those joining us, remember that SCHEDGE is the go-to location to obtain links to participate in sessions. Um, so please keep a, a browser window open to SCHEDGE the entire the entire uh, summit and you'll have all the resources you need. So, you know, getting right into data science, you might ask uh, how many of us are here? Well, we have over 260 folks attending today from all over the state. And you could see, I, I put together a, a small heat map a visual. Uh, this is in using Power BI. It was a pretty, pretty simple import the data and display it um, activity. Um, you can see there's concentrations where there are high areas of population, so that would be expected. Uh, but, but really there are attendees from all across the state. And I think what's, what's also interesting for this uh, first Education Data Science Summit is that we also want to welcome education data peers from 11 states across the US. So you can see um, we have representation from across the US and it's really nice to have you all here. So uh, before our keynote starts, uh, we have a welcome from our San Diego County Superintendent, Dr. Paul Gothold, which we'll present now. Good morning, my name is Paul Gothold, proud superintendent, San Diego County Office of Education. On behalf of our Board of Education, I'm happy to welcome all of you to our first Education Data Science Summit. SDCOE is proud to have worked with the Riverside, Orange, Monterey, San Bernardino County Offices of Education to create this exciting collaboration and learning opportunity. Data is an important component of our work as we use it to understand the best ways to support students and to ensure they are getting what they need and deserve to succeed. During this event, we'll have a variety of data experts share tools, techniques, and ideas that will help you get the most out of your data. There are sessions to help you hone your skills and others to expose you to new tools and data. I hope through this event, you learn a lot that will help you give your students the brightest future possible. Thank you for all that you do and have a wonderful day.
Thank you, Dr. Gothel, for those remarks. Um, so if you, if you haven't heard, key players in education within California are working to develop a statewide longitudinal data system. Um, that's gonna be a data system that will bring together existing systems in K-12, community college, higher education sectors. And this single system is called the Cradle to Career Data System. Um, in California, we have the K-12 system, which is CalPADS. The community colleges have what they call the MIS system, which is the data system for community colleges. And both the CSU and UC systems have their data systems as well. Um, we have these great data systems standing by themselves and it's time to bring them together. So you can imagine the possibilities uh, being able to understand better how students move between education sectors and into the workforce and what issues they face along the way. It's a huge effort to bring these systems together. Uh, there are people, data, data governance, all types of issues. And we have today someone who can give us a status on this work. Kathy Booth is project director of education and data policy at WestEd, where she leads projects that help translate data into action. And in talking with Kathy earlier this week, I, I can see that Kathy has three major goals in her work, data systems, ensuring data is useful, and working to resolve issues of equity. Um, these are all laudable, and these are all also goals of the cradle to career data system. So, of experience as a project manager and architect of systems that make data available to educators of program improvement. Um, she has a history of looking at indicators of student progress, completion, employment, earning outcomes. And Kathy works on projects that map data across systems, including crosswalking K-12 and community college data, tracing adult education pathways, and everything from K-12 to community college, as well as documenting the complete path from early ed all the way to uh, employment or from K-12 to employment. Now, doesn't this line up perfectly with the current cradle to career data system goals? Of course it does. If you have questions for Kathy as she's speaking, please use the Q&A function within Zoom. And without any further ado, and actually a few minutes early, as efficient as we are this morning, uh, let me hand the session over to Kathy Booth. Thank you so much, John. Also here with me is Leanne Fong-Batkin, who has been critical to the development of the plan for the data system. So when you, as I'm talking, I really encourage you to ask any question that comes up for you. And Leanne will be answering it sort of in real time and then she'll share the questions with me so I can talk through them with you. But this is your opportunity to find out anything you're curious about. And I have to say, it's always wonderful to talk to other folks that are really deep in data um, because this project is gonna unleash so much information that I think all of us have been hoping to find. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So we've got the presentation up. And this presentation will be available afterwards if you want to take a look at it. So as John indicated, California has this really unique scenario in which almost every other state in the country has already linked its data sets into some sort of longitudinal data system. Now it varies state by state how easy it is to get access to that information, but at least they figured out how to get it connected. Here in California, we have so many rich data sets that are out in the public domain already, but they're not connected to each other. And that makes it really hard to understand sort of what happens to people over time. So each of us in our particular area, our classrooms, our counseling offices can think about what we're doing to help students, but we can't always tell what happens to them after they leave our schools and go on to the next step in their journey um, for life. So the data system is gonna begin to address those issues by bringing together a really broad range of data sets. So how this all started is back in 2019, the legislature enacted a bill, the Cradle to Career Data System Act. And what it said is California is ready to link data together. And what they wanted to do was put together a planning process to determine how that information should be put together. What's important about this piece of legislation is that normally other states, when they started out, would link their K-12 information with their post-secondary information. 
But this piece of legislation said California was going to go a lot broader than that. So included was going to be information on early learning and care, social services, and workforce information. So we were beginning to really understand that looking at education alone doesn't tell us the whole story about why some students are truly successful and others struggle to get to a living wage after they complete their education. One of the other things that was really important about this piece of legislation is that it was not trying to create anything new. The idea is to take the data that's already reported up to various state agencies and connect it at the state level. So if in the back of your mind you're worrying that cradle to career is going to put additional pressure on your LEA to gather more information when you're already strapped, um, you don't have to worry about that. That's really going to be about getting the data connected and getting resources that will help make your job easier. So the reason that we're speaking to you today, um, Leanne and I, is that WestEd was tapped by the governor's office to lead this planning process. And throughout it, we've really been using a user-centered design approach. So rather than just say, great, let's have a data system, let's figure out you know, what the MOU is gonna look like for data sharing, we went all the way back to the beginning and said, who is this data system for? And for those people, what kind of information would actually help them get more students to their goals? Um, and how would they need to access that information? And then from there, we began to look at the structures of what it is that would make that a reality. One of the things that's been really stupendous about this planning process is the breadth of participation. So up on the screen here, you can see a list of how many different state agencies, we basically have 16 state agencies that have been participating in the planning process. And they represent both the entities that will be putting data into the system as well as other experts um, so that we can really get a deep sense of what is available and how could we best utilize it. But just as importantly, beyond the people that are gonna be providing the data and other government agencies, we wanted to make sure that the people whose data would be in the data system, as well as those that support the use of information and really focus on student access and success were also at the table. So we had a whole host of different committees that were representing different types of expertise that were feeding in recommendations to a work group made up of these state agencies. So all told, we've had more than 200 people involved in the planning process. One of the things that I'm most proud of is that we were just getting started when the lockdown happened. We, we really started in December of 2019. And all of you know that you've been on the front lines of this pandemic. So it would have been very easy for people to say, you know what, now is just not a good time. But instead what we saw is that everybody doubled down and they really said, we have to figure out how to connect our data because we will not know what happened to the class of 2020 unless we all bring our information together and really look at it so that we can develop better strategies for recovering from the pandemic. So it's really been fantastic to have that many people involved. So this is what our planning timeline has looked like. We spent the first four months just deciding what the data system was going to encompass. So one of the problems we have in California is there's so much pent up demand. So when we started out, I would interview people and I'd say, okay, what do you think the cradle to career data system is? And I talked to one agency and they'd say, oh, it's an analytical data system that we're gonna use to better understand the pipeline of students coming into college. And I'd go talk to a different partner and they'd say, oh, um, it's gonna be like Yelp for finding um, childcare in your neighborhood. So obviously these are radically different visions of what type of information we need, how it would be made available and who the intended audience was. So it took us about four months to figure out what the data system should really entail in its first five years, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, and once we had that clear and everyone was in agreement, that's when we moved forward with things like coming up with our vision and mission statements, figuring out in general how we'd get the information hooked together. We figured out where it was going to live um, and the work group has recommended the government operations agency or GovOps. They're a neutral entity that can have a lot of expertise that could help to sort of stand up an office of cradle to career without being partisan in any way. Then we figured out our governance structure, how people would get access to the data, and we put all this together and reported to the legislature that went in in December. Now, at that point, as you recall, we all were thinking things were going to be quite grim um, related to budgets. So we had a very conservative approach of a five-year implementation plan so that we, our budget asks, we were pretty constrained each year. 
Um, now we're getting people who are hoping that it's going to happen a little faster. So it'll be interesting to see where we're at because we're really in that final orange phase you see over on the right hand side, which is the legislative process. So there is um, a, a trailer bill that was released. The governor's budget includes funding for cradle to career. And there's a bill that was put forward by Jackie Irwin's office to um, try to create uh, the same data system. So we're seeing that we're, we're moving into that phase where it's going to get figured out how we're going to implement it. And while the legislature is doing that, the planning teams are putting together really important additional documentation to make it easy to stand up the data system. Everything from data dictionaries, which you all know are critical, as well as really digging into a community outreach strategy to make sure people know that the data system is there and they understand how to use it. So one of the things that I get asked the most when I talk about the data system is how soon do we get to use this? Um, so our hope is that if this goes through with the budget process, the, the data system will begin to be stood up in July of this year, which is incredibly exciting. What we've seen in other states is it takes about a year to get the data loaded into a system and linked and then get it sort of uh, combined in a way that you can actually put it out into the public. So we're guessing that the dashboards and other tools, which I'll describe in a moment, would be available by next summer, so summer of 2022. So um, insight, um, although I know that all of us would hope that would happen faster, um, but we really are poised for action as quickly as possible because so, so much of the work in the planning process has really dug into um, all the technical details. So um, we're, we're gonna try to get that information up and out to you as fast as possible. So let's talk about what the, the work group thought that the data system should be. One of the things that was important is that they wanted something that was truly neutral, sort of like your reliable data store. So the idea is that the role of GovOps and the Cradle to Career Office is going to be to work with the state agencies. Again, this is not going to hit you all as like LEAs to get that information in, combine it, and make sure it's of really high quality and then make it very easy to get to the information that various constituencies need. So one of the things you'll note in the vision is that this expansive um, definition of what should be in the data set got even bigger than what was in the original legislation. So we're looking at early learning and care, connecting to K-12, connecting to higher education, by which we mean all flavors, public, private, and independent. And you'll also note that the, the work group added skills training. So I think there was a recognition that not everybody follows a straight and narrow pathway for their education. Not everybody gradu graduates high school, goes straight to get their bachelor's degree or master's and then goes out into the workforce. For many people, they're in work already by the time they're in high school and they have to come back for education periodically. And we're definitely gonna see that a fair amount in California right now as we respond to the pandemic. So the idea is to bring that information in as well. And that way we'll really understand the relationship between all forms of education and economic outcomes in the context of things like social services, financial aid, and other tools that we have to level the playing field about who gets access to higher education in particular. So that's sort of what the vision is. What's important in the mission statement is the idea and understanding that not everybody needs the same type of information. So the kind of information that I might need as a parent for my um, daughter who is finishing up her sophomore year in high school, so we're beginning to think about college and financial aid, it's really different when I put on my researcher hat and I wanna look at trends about what happens to opportunity youth, where do they go if they leave education? So the idea is to have different types of tools that are geared toward the different needs of a parent thinking about their own child versus a researcher thinking about trends and what's happening in education. So there's really three different components to what the data system is going to be as a result. So the first part is the thing that you normally see in longitudinal data systems. So the, what's going to be different about California, though, is that we're trying to put as much information out into the public domain as possible so that you all don't have to ask permission to get access to the information that you need. So there'll be dashboards that focus on six priority research questions that were laid out by the legislature. So for example, one that looks at um, where do students go to college? So you could pick any particular high school and then you could see trend related information about um, where they went both within California and in other states and then see critical milestones that they're passing in that first year as well as whether they ultimately graduate from that institution. 
Um, then there's going to be a query builder, which I think is going to be the thing that you all are going to be most interested in. So NCES has a tool like this. I don't know if you've ever played around with it, but you can literally drag and drop different data points and then create a summary data table. So granted, this is descriptive statistics. So the um, those of you that do you know, data analytics are like, well, that's a good start. Um, but still, a lot of our first order questions can be answered with descriptive statistics. So there's going to be 200 data points that'll be available. So you could put together a question like, I wanna know what happens to female foster youth in LA County that um, ended up going to community college. And I could just pull together a, a data table that would address those data points. What's important, of course, about that is that there's a de-identification protocol put in, so we're never going to be able to see individuals' data. It'll be blurred or suppressed um, at any low cell sizes to make sure we keep that information secure in the public domain. It'll also be things like fact sheets that take what's in those dashboards and make them available to folks who'd rather look at a piece of paper than a screen. There'll be a research library, so you can go see any report that was developed out of the information that's in the cradle to career data system. And then for those of you who want to really get in and feel like you really need access to unitary data in order to do your analysis, there's a request process so that you'd be able to say, I, I really do want to do a regression analysis because I'm trying to evaluate a particular program. And you would have access to data um, if it gets approved by the, the entity that holds that data set, and you'd be able to access it in a secure data enclave, which means you'd go into an online setting and be able to manip manipulate the data in that secure environment so that we don't have to worry about the data coming out and any of it getting um, inadvertently shared where it shouldn't be. So that's the whole suite of the analytical tools. The second area makes California really unique, and it's the recognition that for people like me as a parent, or maybe the teachers or the counselors that you work with, the kind of data that they find most useful is information about specific individuals. How is it that I can help make sure that my daughter is taking the right classes that make her eligible to go to UC if that's her goal? So there's gonna be a whole suite of what we're calling operational tools. And we're creating these by scaling two existing state programs. So one is californiacolleges.edu, which is run by the California College Guidance Initiative or CCGI, and the other is eTranscript California. So when we make these tools available for free to everyone in the state, this is the suite of resources that your organizations are going to have access to. First is a college and career planning um, curriculum that goes all the way back to middle school, as well as online tools that students can use to explore their interests, learn about possible careers, find out about area colleges that would help them meet those goals. There's, an elig there's a college eligibility monitoring tool so that a teacher or a counselor could go in and look at Carolyn's, my daughter's actual course taking and say, oh, wait a second, it looks like you really need to take one more math class in order to be eligible to apply for UC so that we can quickly get students back on track if they're not on track. With that is the ability to launch college applications from a common website, financial aid applications from a common website, and to look, sorry, link electronic transcripts that would then go to the college to make it really easy so the students don't have to manually re-enter the courses that they took. An important addition to that is that we're going to be expanding what can be included in an electronic transcript to include non-traditional learning artifacts. So this would be like badges or um, other like certifications, things that'll be important as the state begins to do more competency-based education. Another thing that's really important about these data tools is that it will link into an eligibility checker so that as a student is applying for college, they can say, am I also eligible for medical care from the state? for food supports, for CalWORKs, so that we're really at attending to those wraparound supports that make it possible for people to stay in school. And finally, there'll be some support for data cleanup. So some of you may know that particularly for your A to G course designations, it is a, a system that requires exact fidelity in the title of the course. So if you have a single keystroke error, it means that uh, the four-year institutions may not recognize your course as eligible for A to G, and therefore a student's acceptance to college can be rescinded. One of the problems, as you know, in LEAs is it's not like you have a whole team of people sitting around that are there to do the detailed data cleanup. It may be the person who has to simultaneously serve the role of receptionist, school nurse, and data entry clerk who's putting this information in. So there'll be one-on-one -on -one support for each LEA to go in, just make sure that those um, courses are described accurately and help with fixing it so that you make sure your students are getting credit for the work they've done. 
The final component will be a whole suite of support tools, because as our work group kept reminding us, dashboards and data don't do anything on their own. So our really intentional approach to making sure a broad range of audiences know the data system exists, know about the tools that are most relevant for them, understand what that information is that they're looking at and are able to really use it. And built in with this is the idea of letting the people who know the data best, like you all, being able to give feedback about places where you see things that um, don't look quite right in the data or where there's an additional feature that would make a really big difference for the work that you need to do so that the system can keep evolving to meet your needs. I'm gonna pause for a second. Leanne, are there any questions that have come up that would be helpful for me to answer before I go into some more detail? Yes, uh, there's a couple of questions so far. So the first question is, is the pandemic affecting the cradle to career budget and putting the timeline in jeopardy? And is the pandemic affecting planning in other ways? The second question is, how will data be tracked for California students who will continue education out of state? Okay, so let's start with the pandemic. I think we were all really nervous, especially about like November, December last year, that there would be other needs that would just make the data system um, fall down the priority list as it as it should if we're really dealing with issues of making sure that kids are able to get back into school and learn. Um, but what we're seeing is that there's a recognition that we really can't make those investments blind. We need to know what's happening to our students. So the sense is that there is continuing support for the data system. And because of all of the federal aid that has come in, it doesn't feel like it has to be a, a, a choice where the data system gets done instead of something that we really need for students. So we think it's gonna be okay. I'm gonna knock on wood right now, of course, until we get through um, the, the May revise and the final budget, we won't know for sure. But right now things feel pretty good. Um, related to what happens when students go out of state, the plan is to purchase a file from the National Student Clearinghouse, which gathers information on college enrollments from across the country. So that would allow us to be able to identify when students are somewhere else. We might not have all the same data points that we do about how that student is doing in their progress toward gradu graduation once they get to the four-year institution, but you'd at least be able to understand if um, how many of your students actually went to Yale, for example. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Yes. Uh, does the anticipated design and implementation of the cradle to career system utilize open standards and open source software in any capacity? So we've had some really interesting conversations about the best way to stand up the technology to build the data system. When we started out, a lot of people were still thinking in sort of old technology terms. I think a lot of people were thinking that there was going to be a big server in a government office and all the data was going to be sitting in it. One of the things that we did is we, we looked at what other states have done, and it seems like the way um, people are really recommending that we build data systems is that you, you pull together widely available tools. So a really good example is in the concept of matching student records. So embedded in the legislation was actually a proposal that we scale um, the K-12 student identifier SSID across all of the providers of data as the way to link the records. But that was problematic for a couple of reasons. One is if we're going to be bringing in things like social service data, they're not going to have a K-12 SSID. But also it's a security risk because it's, a, it's a, a number that's around a lot of different places, which would make it easier for somebody to be able to figure out who students were even when we were trying to make the data obscured. So we looked at what other states have done and went with a master data management solution. Um, and this is, it's basically fuzzy matching on steroids. It, it, it's algorithms that look at all of the data points that you would have in common across data sets. And then look at things like the William, Bill, Will, Guillermo problem of, of, of names that are, are just variations on things. So this has been used by a number of other um, states in order to match their data. We're actually really interested in what Minnesota is doing. And I saw there's a Minnesota person, person that's registered because they're actually looking at two generation strategies. So they're linking their early learning and care data to their K-12 and post-secondary data to be able to understand what happens in a family unit as you do various interventions. So whether these are gonna be open source tools remains to be seen. We're clear about the types of things we want to procure, but that procurement process won't start until the data system is actually funded and it's up and running. Um, but we did do a request for information um, last summer about those master data management solutions. And we had a range of responses, some of which were proprietary, some of which were not. I need two more questions if you can. Yes. 
Okay, uh, this is first from Nick. County offices of education perform a wide range of support tasks that use row level access to LEA data. Will COEs have to get approval on an ad hoc basis or will they have to work only within the enclave like any other outside entity? The second question is, if the data system leverages data systems, for instance, CalPads and K-12, it's mostly annual data, will there be any higher frequency data in the system? These are actually related questions. So one of the things that we um, looked at was what do we do about these really rich regional ecosystems that are developing? Um, we looked a lot at what's happening in Silicon Valley, for example, um, and especially in San Mateo, where there are data sets where you can look at broad analytical trends or you can drill all the way down to the individual student records so that you could design interventions. Um, the decision for the first phase of the data system was that was more complicated than was reasonable to try to do in the very beginning. So what that means is you know, you'll report up to CalPADS as you normally would, and CDE will move information from CalPADS into the cradle to career system. So you'll be able to access that query builder and be able to pull descriptive statistics anytime you want. You don't have to ask for permission for that. It's only if you wanna go in and for example, if you're doing an evaluation of a particular intervention and you know that these students got it and these students didn't, that you'd have to ask for permission. That process um, will be the same no matter who you are, but it's very clearly laid out. Um, so you, we have to run it through an IRB, for example, and it'll be the Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects that will be the IRB, but all that will be very clearly articulated. So if you're doing a research or evaluation process, you will have to go through the same procedure as everybody else. So that doesn't attend to the issue of, of the fact that data becomes stale. If you're looking at trend data, it's generally okay. I, I, obviously the pandemic changed this because there's stuff we need to know about really quickly. Uh, but in general, you know, we're, we're used to looking historically. So the entities that are gonna be providing um, up to the minute information are those operational tools. So if you go in, if I pulled up my, my daughter's um, college eligibility, it would be looking in near real time at information that's coming in. So currently CCGI works directly with individual LEAs and sort of hooks into their data system so that we can have closer to live monitoring. The proposal is to update CalPADS so that that live monitoring can happen out of the state system, which is the beginning of us moving toward data that is less stale. So this is one of the things that's really important. Some people have been perceiving our analytical tools and our operational tools as two different separate buckets. But with this integration with CalPADS, there's the opportunity to begin to create a more modern data system that would yield more actionable information. And then there's a possibility that down the road, there'd be some way that information could flow two ways. So it could flow into a regional data system to augment information that you might be collecting locally. Is that it for the questions, Leanne? That's all at this time. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just dig a little bit deeper to give you some examples of some of the specific types of information that have been planned. Um, so we, again, we, we, we'd segmented who were the different audiences and what would they want to do with information from a state data system. So um, imagine that you're a foster youth. One of the ways that the data system would help you is that when you're applying to colleges, you can have an authorization that basically says that the Department of Social Services will verify that you were a foster youth as part of your college application, which means that the college knows that you're there and that they can tell you right away about all of the supports that are available that are specifically available for foster youth. So that's a, one example of a way that they would benefit from this type of a data system. Um, for college students, they'd have that ability to say, okay, I'm finishing up community college. While I was in this um, construction crafts program, I actually learned how to use SolidWorks. And so I'm going to append my SolidWorks um, credential to my college application so that when I move up, that my next college knows that I have this competency and they can give me credit for it. So those are examples of how students are going to benefit. For families, um, what's going to be important is we really saw this in the last year, that if you didn't have someone in your family that went to college, 
many of our students were left without resources to figure out what they could do related to going to college. And we saw a huge drop off in the number of first gen students that went to college. So this makes it so that there's ubiquitous information available about college options, about financial aid options, about job options, and that your LEA doesn't have to purchase this service. It's just something that's going to be available so that you'll be able to devote your resources to working with your students to utilize these tools so that they can begin to make plans. And then, as I mentioned, you'll be able to go in as a parent to be able to look at, you, you log in just like you would into PowerSchool or something like that, where you can go in and say, how is my kid doing? Um, as they're picking classes for next term, I get to have a, a say, I can help guide her, um, which builds you know, knowledge among parents as well about what it takes to get into college, which can be helpful. Um, in the financial aid area, high school counselors could see if students have actually finished their financial aid application. So as you probably know, when someone's filling out the FAFSA and they get to the fact that they need tax information from their parents, that can stop students cold. So a counselor could go in and see the progress of each student on the application, figure out who's gotten stalled out, and then go to them and work with them to resolve those issues. So there's been some, um, Riverside District has really done a lot um, related to um, using CCGI. So you should be reaching out to them. They've done, they've used it to be able to set targets for how many students are applying to college or for financial aid and have been able to greatly increase those numbers using these types of monitoring tools. And then as I mentioned, you'll get some help in better data so that your student doesn't get denied access to UC because of a data um, entry error. So those are the operational tools. So let's talk a little bit about those dashboard contents. So I, I, I talked to earlier about how you'll be able to see where students end up going to college and how well they do as one example. But one of the things that's really important to understand about the dashboard is that the goal is to make this something that would be comprehensible for someone who was not a data expert. So information will be displayed in infographic format. Um, we took a lot of inspiration from Kentucky. Um, you should look at KY Stats, their, their site, because they've just done a great job in making the information very understandable. One of the things that'll be really great about this as well is that there'll be all sorts of ways that you can disaggregate the results so that if we're really, um, if our goal is to close equity gaps, you'll be able to see some comparisons so that you can identify groups that you may need to find out more about to figure out what you can do to support them in getting to their goals. And you'll be able to look at results for your own institution or you can aggregate up to regional and statewide levels. So, We've got a couple of specific um, topics. We want to look at the long-term impact of chronic absenteeism in K-12. Of course, a big concern after the students that were unable to participate um, during the pandemic. Um, in addition to the issues about K-12 students going to college, we'll also be looking at issues of financial aid. Was there a big body of students who were eligible for financial aid but didn't apply or who were approved for it but then didn't end up receiving it? Um, these will really help us figure out ways to, to better target our efforts to help students afford college. And then finally, there'll be information on employment outcomes. So we'll understand um, which students made it to a living wage and when in their educational journey did they make it to that benchmark so that we can really begin to understand how we sort of make good on the promise that an education is what gets you to a better life, a more stable life, um, and therefore more opportunities to engage in society. The query builder, as I mentioned, is this chance where you can pull all sorts of different details. So a, a really good, um, a really important component of this query builder is the idea that it moves away from just looking at student variables as a way to try to understand outcomes. So the one challenge with just disaggregating by student characteristics is that when you're looking at those you know, side by side column charts, you can say, well, what's wrong with that kind of student? Like, what's up with foster youth? They're not doing nearly as well as everybody else, which ignores all the institutional contexts that can make a really big difference about who's able to thrive and succeed. So you'll be able through the query builder to pull in all sorts of um, additional information that can help you to contextualize results. So if you're trying to figure out issues about why more people are, are like, why you have so much chronic absenteeism, you'll be able to look at it in the context of how much there's a suspension um, problem at that school. Um, if you wanna understand college going rates, looking at how many students are finishing A to G requirements, which often has to do with the kind of counseling they're getting and the offerings that that LEA has about courses. Or you'll understand their family context. Is it that these students, um, their parents didn't go to college, they didn't have that knowledge, 
or for example, if it's taking students longer to complete community college is part of the issue that many of the students were not yet proficient in English. So first they had to master the academic language of a second language or a third before they learned that specific content that can help to explain some of those critical variables. The last thing I just really wanna clarify is that this data system is being designed with privacy, security, and neutrality in mind. That was part of why GovOps was picked as the entity that would host it. GovOps is not gonna do its own research. It's not gonna have policy statements. It's not gonna say they have the real answer and somebody else's answer is wrong. So this really is a place where it's neutral and you can get information that you can trust. All the information that's being passed that's about an individual is going through a, a highly um, sophisticated password protected interface to make sure that I can only see the A to G work of my own daughter and not somebody else at the school. And then when we're putting information in the public domain, there's a very carefully constructed de-identification policy, which conforms to requirements both for health information and educational information, so that we make sure that those public tools don't create um, inadvertent places where student identities are um, identified. <laughs> and then finally, as I, as I mentioned, we've got this um, whole process. If you want to have um, individual level data, it will be anonymized, but even that makes it, you could still potentially rematch it. So that's why it's in a secure data enclave. We've got an IRB process and we're really going to make sure that that information is thoroughly de-identified before it gets removed from the secure enclave. So this is a lot of information. I'm showing you a picture of our website. Um, I encourage you to go there. Um, if you go to the recommendations section, you can see summaries of all the things that I've just described to you. Um, we also have some FAQs and other things that are there um, that could help to answer information. So um, hopefully in July, this will be transitioning over to the actual website of the Office of Cradle to Career. Um, but all this information will remain available. If you're curious about how we handle things like governance or legal agreements, if you go under the meeting information drop down menu, um, all of the notes are there from all of our meetings or our recordings. Um, and Leanne and I are really here to serve as your Google to get through the website. There's a ton of content. So you can contact us at any point. If you just are like, I just really wanna know how you got to that decision about the secure data enclave. And we can point you to the exact documents and, and recordings of meetings where we heard from the San Diego Supercomputer Center, for example, about what they've been able to do. So up there on the screen is our contact information, the URL for the website. We have a listserv, although we're almost done with the planning process, so there's not as much to see, um, but we do have meetings that are open to the public. Our next work group meeting is May 27th. You're welcome to join us. So anyway, any final questions before we wrap up? Yes, I have several questions. So okay. let me um, pick a couple. So do you anticipate that at some point during the life cycle of the data, individuals may want their data removed or added to the system as a result of broader data privacy rules or simply opting out or in? Let's start with that one. Absolutely. So um, we have an opt-out policy in any individual, including a minor. So if you've got a highly politicized 15-year-old who's like, I don't want big data in my life, they can request that their information is removed from the linked data set. So that's already baked in. My mouse is misbehaving. <laughs> okay. And then another question was, uh, let's see, does the Cradle to Career Roadmap include any updates to currently accessible public data systems such as DataQuest? For example, would DataQuest eventually expose a public API for REST requests? Um, we have not talked about that part. The, the place where we expect that there'll be some stuff flowing from Cradle to Career back into the data providers will probably have to do with consistency of data definitions. So for example, we have a subcommittee that's been meeting to talk about how earnings data get calculated. Right now, each post-secondary um, entity has a slightly different way they calculate it. So you might see the um, different partners working together to refine those definitions. Um, but I don't think that we're gonna, it's going to result in the changing of the, the tools that each entity has provided other than the updating of CalPads so that it can do more live um, connections with CCGI. Thank you. The next question is, there might be instances where the student may have attended school in a different country and reliable data from that group of students may not exist on the data sets and may not provide a full picture for programs that may benefit those students. Does this program anticipate anything on that regard? The same could be said for other states. Um, at this point, 
we really are going to be constrained by our state borders, um, and that will create gaps. Um, but unfortunately, that's going to be a problem for a later day. But our hope is that as you know, more and more states are rethinking the way they do their longitudinal data system, that there'll be opportunities for data exchanges. We've seen that already with employment data, um, with the SWIFT agreement that allows people to pass employment information for um, evaluation purposes across state lines. So maybe that'll be a future thing. Okay, Tracy would like, uh, Tacy would like to know, I am extremely excited about this project and its potential use cases. I understand that this data dashboard will come at no cost to the LEAs but I want to understand further who exactly is paying for this. Taxpayers? Is the funding built into the legislation? And if so, for how long do we know? It's the taxpayers. So this is in the governor's budget for next year. Um, we're doing one year requests at a time, but the understanding is that if the state is going to build this, it would sustain it. So the budget ask from the work group was 15 to $20 million per year. So, um, our hope is that it will I mean, really the, the, the thinking of the work group was if the data system produces very high value products, it will be sustained because people will realize its importance. Um, and you see that with even like allocations that are made for data systems that already exist within other entities that are smaller, which gives us hope for the future. Thank you. And this is about community colleges. So will community college efforts around a common course numbering system be a part of the C2C data system? How would articulation be folded into CalPADS in K-12? Um, there's not a data point that's been articulated yet for the common course numbering. Um, there is some information in the data system that looks at particular course taking patterns. So for example, that critical measure on getting through transfer level math and English is one of the data points that would be in there. Um, but at this point, we're not looking at providing information at the course level for every student, at least as part of the first phase. One of the good things about the design is that over time, if there's a clear reason to expand what's in the data set, um, the governing board could take a look at that. And we actually have an advisory board structure where people would bring proposals and say, we're trying to resolve this challenge. If we had this type of information, it would be helpful. Um, and then the governing board could prioritize it. And they're already doing that with the issue of GPA. So um, the research community wanted GPA included in the data system. The data experts from the agency said, our data is not in very good shape. So it violates the principle of reliable data in cradle to career, but they've said that they'll work on improving the GPA data so that in the future it can be included. We're over time, aren't we, John? Yeah, one we, more are, question. we are fine. If there's a question, another question or, or one or two that you would like to answer, please go ahead and, and then we'll start our transition to the sessions. But. Wonderful. Thank you. David would like to know, will there be an API or other ways to run queries in addition to the query builder? Nope. The, the query builder will be the mechanism by which you'll be able to access it. And that's to keep the data secure, to ensure that the appropriate de-identification um, protocol is applied. I don't see any other questions at this time. Thank you. Well, great. Again, reach out to me or Leanne if any other questions come up along the way. We're so eager to engage it. You are one of our core constituencies. Um, so I hope that as we begin the work on its development, it will be a user-centered design process as we move forward to specific tools um, that you track what's going on, you weigh in, you make sure that GovOps knows what's most useful to you um, because that'll make sure that the tool really does achieve its goal of providing actionable information. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a wonderful um, exploratory experience for the rest of today, thinking about data points and learning about resources. Um, I'm just delighted to have had to get, get to spend the morning with you.